Yo, everyone, welcome back. Brand new techish. It is me, Michael Bahane, and I am joined with Abadesi of Hustle Crew. Woo, woo. Techish go. is your favorite tech and <laughs> pop culture show. We're going to break through all of the latest tech news and the pop culture news. So, never fear, we're here to give you that great content. So, where do you want to start with? So, I had an idea where to start. So, let me just lead. The go for it. Former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, he came mm. out, man, and he, he he wasn't mincing his words. So he had a Stanford talk and it was on YouTube. And somebody asked him, okay. like, yo, like, why do you think Google is kind of a bit mm. of a laggard when it comes to AI now? And he was like, yo, we got too soft. We got too soft. Wow. There's there's too much work-life balance. In fact, you know what? Let me, oh, let me, let me, snap. let me play a presentation. Turn it up. Longer a Google employee. Yes. Um, in the spirit of full disclosure. Um, Google decided that work-life balance and going home early and working from home was more important than winning. <laughs> and the startups, the reason startups work... Is so employees want to work from home, but if employees are working from home, they're not working as hard. And that's why they've lost, uh, lost out on the AI race. I mean, there's a huge assumption in that theory that the race is being won purely just by like hours on the clock like not by mm -hmm. talent or you know diversity of people working on the teams or you know any other variables that affect innovation just because you're sitting at your desk doesn't mean you're actually doing good work just because you're sitting in the right. office doesn't actually mean you're generating amazing ideas or, or or driving innovation in fact a lot of the research shows that when it comes to productivity having like a tailored approach to an individual as in letting individuals pick the environments in which they're productive is actually like far more effective than bringing everyone into an open plan office for example where people who have like adhd and neurodivergence tend to like struggle with concentration in fact like a lot of people are now even questioning like the design of open plan offices and whether or not they actually yeah. do like generate an innovation and productivity so i feel like his argument is so flawed because it just like hinges on this assumption that when you're in the office, you're doing good work. And yeah, I don't know. What do you think? I think you, you touched on some good points. One, obviously, Google's problem to me is the lack of vision. It hasn't been necessarily mm. where you're based as an employee. They obviously took the eye off the ball. They obviously got lazy in terms of just like, what are they yeah. working on, right? How long does it take for a new feature to get built at Google? You know, I think yeah. irrespective of whether the employees are in their HQ or working remotely, I don't think that necessarily changes. The other yeah. thing I would say, though, that I do tend to agree, I think we say the word business as if every business is the same, but let's keep it real. Like True. if you're working on a small business or a startup that is bootstrapping or whatever, like I'm not sure that it's as cutthroat at that top level. I honestly feel like that sort of like AI race right now, it's almost like the Olympics of business because there's so much on the line. There's <laughs> trillions on the line. And yeah, if yeah, I was yeah. the CEO of Google, would I feel away if mm. I felt like, yo, maybe we should have a bit of FaceTime. Maybe we should, you know, lock in a little bit. I don't know. I, I think there is something to it, but I do think it's not, it's an easy answer. But I think yeah. in general, I do think the culture at big tech, if I had to quantify a percentage, how many people at these companies are actually doing the productive work, it would be mm. a shocking low number, basically. Wow. So it's a do culture problem. I. A hundred percent agree. Because they're, they're in coasting mode. Do you think that there is like a hunger for success, a hunger for for growth that that is lost once you you know become a public company, once you hit these crazy valuations where you're kind of just like, do you know what? We've hit a lot of the goals that we meant to hit, and and we're good. Whereas if you're like up and coming, you're a Sam Altman trying to like break out of the like what I see, you know, shackles and like do your own thing and establish yourself or you see the opportunity ahead of you and you want to prove, you know, Elon Musk wrong and all the other haters wrong yeah. and, and win, you've got this hunger, you've got this drive and that in itself is going to push you to work around the clock and push you to take big risks. And, and to your point, you can also take bigger risks because you're not a big, you know, sluggish I, company. I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's got anything to do with scale. I think it depends on what kind of business you have. And Google basically had a monopoly mm. for like 20 years. They pretended mm. they didn't. They would say like, yeah. we're a technology company, we're an advertisement company, but no, as a search company, they had an absolute monopoly and they were printing yes. money. So in that sense, Definitely. there was no evolutionary forces forcing them to work hard. Why should you? You're printing mm. money. Yeah, let's work on, you know, Gmail. Let's work on YouTube. You know, it's all nice, stuff, extra stuff. But the reality is search is what made them all their cash. And that was yeah. never threatened. Now they go from a monopoly environment 
to a non-monopoly environment because ChatGPT is releasing Search GPT, which is basically a, yeah. a search engine. Perplexity is quite good. I've used it. Claude, another AI model, I use that often. I'm constantly using these tools actually much more than I ever search ever because they can give me clear, concise answers. Even if I have to double check if they're correct, it's still not. Yeah. Let me look through this random website of listicles and let me look at you know this, <laughs> this paywalled article from the Wall Street Journal. Actually, no, like these tools are going to yeah. give me, you know, something concise. So that's what I think the problem with Google is. They've gone from monopoly environment to a non-monopoly environment and they're slowly realizing that yes, there can still be a great business, but it's not, they can't coast anymore. Um, the world's but, changed yeah, and they answers, fell asleep. The world's changed at the wheel. and they fell asleep at the wheel. Mm. Um, so the whole thing about like, do, does anybody do any work? So I found this hilarious, um, let me see if I can share it. It was not an audio time this time. And dude basically is a guy that's working at uh, Amazon. And he says, I joined Amazon 1.5 years ago after I was included in Google's layoff. I joined with the intention of doing nothing, getting free money and eventually getting picked. I put in about eight hours a week of work, mostly in meetings. Without exaggeration, I own zero kingpin goals, which is Amazon's goal process. I resolved seven tickets and delivered one automated dashboard that I built using ChatGPT in three days. <laughs> You're a former Amazon person, yeah? Does that mix, the, like, does that resemble anything that you saw at Amazon or was the sales <laughs> side of the business so different from the tech side of the business? I mean, damn, I was on the wrong team. No, I mean, I think I told you one of my favorite, like, stories at Amazon was I joined a team and I was talking about Instagram and the head of marketing was like, what's Instagram? <laughs> It's like a story. Yeah, whoa, yeah. red flag you know amazon at the time i joined had like a hundred thousand employees and i yeah, think when different. you are so big every department is run differently every team is run differently and like don't get me wrong there are a lot of processes a lot of leadership principles but there are definitely a lot of like intentional choices to like mitigate risk in the company that includes giving people like a really low level of responsibility so as an example when i had a job at Groupon, I think I had, if you clicked my name on Salesforce and saw how many merchants were technically, you know, under my management, it was like a list of, you know, hundreds, you know, approaching a thousand, like that was the volume of, of deals we were doing. And that was the amount of responsibility on the team. And this would have been like maybe even a year or two after the IPO. When I joined Amazon and they gave me my list of accounts, there were like 30 companies on it. And I was like, I've got Damn. a whole year. And I'm only looking after 30 people who have already bought the product. I'm just in charge of like renewing them. Uh, so, you know, if you divide that, there's 52 weeks in a year. It's like, I have more weeks than clients. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. 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 I think, I think the thing with engineers as well, I think there was definitely, I don't know about now, but there was definitely a feeling of like, if you've got a super smart engineer that's available to be hired, just hire them basically, especially with this company starting printing money. And I think they hire them and then like, we'll figure out something for them to do. We just don't want them to work for <laughs> Facebook or, Meta or Apple, whatever, right? Yeah, somebody else basically, right? There was definitely that philosophy at Google for sure, where it was like, oh, you're a PhD in AI. We don't know what to do with you. We're just going to hire you. We're going to give just you like you. a million dollars a year just so you don't work on your own startup and compete with us basically, right? So oh, maybe there's something to it where the engine, there's some engineers that are coasting. And then also, if you are non-technical, you have no idea mm. what it takes to manage, you, you have no idea how long something takes. So if you're an engineer who's been managed by somebody who's non-technical, you can really finesse them, to be honest. Like he yeah, said, yeah, I've built so this true. tool in three, you know, in, with ChatGPT in a handful of days. And I've, you know, I've been basically saying like, yeah, it's taken me like, you know, months basically, month. right? So <laughs> yeah, so yeah. But I think, I think you'll get caught eventually. I think so anyway. But yeah, in terms of what that number is of who's actually working, I, I wouldn't put a percentage to it, but I wouldn't think it's as high as you that's know, true you in expect. so many big companies. That's true in so many big companies. And you have to remember that you're coming into this with the mindset of someone who is a startup owner. You know, you're in a competitive space. You've been building a business for years. Before that, you're an early engineer helping other people build their startups from the ground up. So your attitude to work is like where the stakes are so high. Every hour you spend not coding, not selling, not writing code is life or death for the business, but there are so many companies that, you know, we can put into the category of like mature companies, established companies, where people literally swan in at nine, spend two hours in the kitchen, drinking coffee, you know, sharing biscuits, talking about what was on TV the night before, going to their freaking desk, like dawdling until lunch, taking their lunch, coming back and being like, cool, I'm home in a few hours. Like, you know, that is, work for a lot of people i'm not saying like all people um so i think it's also important to remember that you know it's not always about the grind 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 like 
you know, you can get to a point in a business where you're basically in maintenance mode, right? And people are acting in a way that supports that. But I'm not saying like everything's got to be a grind in it, but dudes are coming on Twitter mm. basically saying that they work eight hours a week in it <laughs> and they're probably getting paid like half a million a year. So I've yeah, got to make a comment. I mean, on it. I'm not saying everyone's got, I- I've had those jobs yeah. where I'm not doing much as well. Don't get it twisted. I've had those jobs where we're going on coast mode or whatever, whatever. But yeah. we weren't doing eight hours of work a week. That, that, <laughs> I'm this jealous. Is, this is I'll take that figures. job. Trust me. So you I'll know what? Yeah? One thing about, do you, <laughs> did you hear about how um, Labour, the new, uh, newly elected government in the UK, actually, they're now instituting a policy where your boss cannot contact you after after work hours, after 6 p.m.? Hallelujah. And, um, Hallelujah. And, yeah, I think I think it's modelled after France had a similar policy as well. But one thing yes, I wanted to bring France up. Does. In, 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 yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up in this context, though, is that so the new Starbucks mm. CEO who's been, been brought in to replace the old Starbucks CEO. Oh, he was at like Chipotle before, right? Reason, that's the new CEO, yeah. But the previous CEO mm. was caught on video okay, basically yeah. saying, don't call me after 6 p.m. If you call me <laughs> after 6 p.m., you're going to get in trouble, basically, because it can't be that deep. Everything can be done during kind of nine to five hours. Okay. What's your thoughts on A, that labor policy? B, mm. do you think that as a public company CEO that you can really have that life of being like, yeah, after 6 p.m., there's no need to call me? I mean, no, I think that's question. ridiculous, especially when Starbucks are like open till 11 p.m. Like, what if, God forbid, someone dies in a <laughs> Starbucks at 10.55? You're telling me that like people are just supposed to like follow the protocol and like do what they need to yep. do. Like, if it's a CEO, you want to know about that. Like before the, pre- you don't want to be finding out reading your like morning paper and sipping on your yeah. coffee that like, you know, someone died on one of your pro- premises or something like that. I mean, I'm using an extreme example. Um, look. I completely understand like the need to establish boundaries, you know, manage your mental health and all that kind of stuff. But when you're coming in for one of the highest paid jobs in the world, for one of the largest Mm -hmm. corporations in the world, then you're coming here trying to have like the boundaries of someone in like middle management or entry level, like, nah, bro, I'm sorry, what are you getting paid for? What are you getting paid for? Mm. Like heavy is the head that wears the crown. Then you're out here trying to like finesse it. Like you don't, I don't know. Like, you know, I, and my team always encourage people when they're like on holiday or when they're on leave to like genuinely switch off, like delete emails from your phone, like delete chat, like really, really try and switch off. But at the same time, like I remain available, whatever the time is, especially if, because we're a service business, you know what I mean? Like if we're delivering something specific Mm -hmm. time and that's late night for me here in the UK, I'm still going to be vigilant that I might need to be around in case something goes wrong. If we're delivering something in Asia Pacific and that's super early morning for me, like, you know, even I personally just, I just want to feel like comfortable just not being accessible. I don't know. What do you think? But then hold on. Okay. So the labor law that might be instituted, obviously after Mm. 6 p.m. you shouldn't really be able to to contact your employees. But now let's say, for example, your team is expanding, business is booming. You decide to hire an exec team. So this is not a rank and yeah. file employee. This is somebody who's going to be on a good salary and they possibly have yeah. equity, maybe 2%, 5%, because you're like, I really want to entice this person. Now, let's yeah. say something happens, like we said, in Asia, it could be a crime for you to email, call them and be like, well, <laughs> we, need to, we need to fix this. So like, yeah, pe- do you think that law needs a bit of nuance where like, if you're in a startup environment, mm. and you're telling me that you lock up 601, 601, yeah? Tell yeah. Man, like, I can't send you a call and be like, can you just log in quickly on Slack and send me the information? <laughs> Catch man in handcuffs. After the hell, I... <laughs> you know, like people going to junior meme when you see him walking off in handcuffs. Like that's me. Like it's like, what did he do? Like yeah, six or one. That's an email. <laughs> six or one. So funny. I think what's your these thoughts, rules? These rules exist to like stop people from like being abused. Um, but yeah, you know, when I joined startups, they were like, "Do you sign away your right to have like a maximum forty hour week?" This is when we were still in the EU, and I would just sign it and be like, "Yeah, oh, of yeah. course, I sign away that right." You know what I mean? And in a similar way, like it's also illegal to discriminate against someone because of their disability status, because of their religion, because of their parent status, because of their gender, because of their race. But people are still doing that, right? So just because it's illegal to message someone after 6 p.m. doesn't mean companies are going to stop doing it because discrimination laws haven't stopped companies from discriminating. So my thoughts on it are, my thoughts on it are like, great that they're putting this into law. Great that it's going to start a conversation on like, you know, healthy boundaries, respecting contract terms, and, and hopefully give 
give an opportunity to people who are being abused in their employment contract, you know, a point to challenge an employer in, in a court of law, you know, in a tribunal, like yeah, this is why this six hour thing rule exists, but it doesn't mean that people are going to stop being emailed or called after 6 PM. No way. That's a very good point you make. Cause I know a lot of people that have ended up, you know, in tribunals and yeah. they think to themselves, the amount of times I was grinding till 8 PM for this company or 9 PM. And mm. that's not on paper. That's not being demonstrated. My loyalty to the company, what I put in is now basically being ignored and we're dealing with a certain incident. But if I could say, actually, I, this company broke, violated laws, exactly. making me do the extra work. And I did it, you know, for the sake of the thing, I could demonstrate that actually, you know, I was a team player, basically. That might be a great thing to have as well. Um, but let's see if yeah. they push through that law. I think, listen, for 99% of examples, it, it makes complete sense. People have the right to switch off or clock off. It's good for psychology, your, your mental health. It's good for making you actually mm. be a more productive employee over the long term so you don't burn out. But I just found that yeah. funny where I was like, imagine I said, imagine I'm, say, I'm texting you at 601, like, you know what I mean? Six, <laughs> five past six. <laughs> and I hear, I hear po -po a knock on the door. On the the door. <laughs> <laughs> po po on the door. Um, do you know what though? Like, I just, I, one last uh, story on like, uh, kind of like big tech, yeah. You know what? This, make me, this, this is hilarious, isn't it? So I'm going to do my little screen share thing again. Dude who worked at Amazon, it looks like. We don't know where he really worked in it. But he decided to do a tweet where he basically said, a CEO I worked for seduced my wife in retaliation for my pushback on him at work. Shut up. This I is got divorced true. and left the company. When I say no. I truly understand how some executive teams can be political snake bits, I trust you will believe me. Learn from my pain. Do the follow. And then he starts a Twitter thread. He posted this on LinkedIn as well. People then went on his LinkedIn and saw that his only VP role was at Amazon. Did Jeff uh, Bezos smash his wife? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. Was that when he know, was in his like, like Iron Man ripped status, like pumping, 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 doing berries, you know doing what? CrossFit? Because, like because, what? Because Jeff was Jeff was obviously got divorced. But there must have been a long time when basically he was also estranged or separated from his wife before he, well, he got he was all just hitting up the apps. I think Laura said. <laughs> he was hitting up the apps. He was he was hitting up the exec team's wifeys. That's insane. That's what was insane. his pseudonym? Like Jim Beefos uh, or something. Like, you look familiar, do I? I think about, <laughs> but think about this though. Like, imagine you, you're bringing your wife around, like, or your significant other to mm. a work do. And you See, know that's that what your you boss... go wrong. Never bring your significant other to a billionaire's party. Like that's just that's what I'm that's saying. Just... <laughs> though you're bringing your wife around, and your boss is worth a hundred billion dollars, and he's getting in shape yeah. now. How do you compete? You can't, you can't. Yeah. You're telling your wife, yeah, we, we can't have we can't have you know two holidays this year, and you your boss out there, he's living on a yacht. Somewhere. Oh, that's hilarious. You better what, be putting in the work laughing? somewhere. Look, <laughs> you know, it's not just about the money, but you gotta be doing something. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> But what I'm going to say is, listen, if this did happen to him, and, it, and this, let's say this happened to me, yeah. for no amount of online clout would I ever share this news to the world. <laughs> Why? I would die with this information if my CEO seduced my wife in retaliation for what I did at work. No, nah, that's crazy. Anyways, <laughs> shout out to Ethan Evans. Hope you're well. Um, I feel like the problem that started asked... long before that event as well. Like, come on now. Come on. Like, come, like <sighs> yeah, it's true. Billionaires, you know what? Like, who actually wants to be married to a billionaire? Like, they're never going to be around. Like, yes, you're you're marrying the money, but you're not marrying the person. They're never going to be around. They're like almost certainly like oh, evil, right? Because no one gets rich by okay. like being good. Um, mm -hmm. Third, they're like friends with horrible people, like Jeffrey Epstein 2.0 and whatever. Like, you, imagine the kind of people you're going to like have to hang around. Um, like it's not a nice life. And then like, you can't actually like go anywhere that you used to go because now you're like super recognizable and like being paparazzi and stuff like that. Like, I feel like his problem started long before that event. Like he didn't just leave, she didn't just leave him because she met a billionaire. She left him because he didn't take the trash out and he never listened to her and other stuff like that. <laughs> you know what? No, no, but let's 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 keep it real though. Sometimes people do leave you because they see a better opportunity. That does happen as well. I'm not denying that what you said makes complete sense for most situations, but sometimes you see a golden ticket and you're like, I'm gone. I'm sorry. Um Do you reckon? And, it, it happened I don't to, know. It, and you know what? It, it, ha it happened to um there was that funny meme of when like Jeff Bezos took his uh, new wife to the Oscars and um she mm. was on his shoulder and then they were they were talking to like Leonardo DiCaprio. And she was just looking up like in absolute amazement. And it was like, listen, sometimes there's always a bigger fish. There's always a bigger fish. Anyways, <laughs> um, I digress. Um, 
But, you know, obviously we're not just a tech show, we're talking about culture in it. And I wanted to talk about somebody who, I think a lot of us have a lot of love for this person, but it might be for no real reason beyond just like what she was able to do with her music. So Lauren Hill, um, mm. she's, the Fugees, the Fugees basically were, were going to do a reunion and they're doing a tour. Yeah. I think they're doing the States and they're doing the UK. The UK shows are still going off, but the US shows basically have been cancelled due to poor ticket sales. So obviously one, that's to do with the fact that she has now got this reputation. She's now got this reputation where she always turns up late. Everyone knows that like a Lauren Hill show, mm. she's not turning up on time. And a lot of times yeah. her attitude is you should, you should be grateful that kind of like I'm coming anyways, <laughs> basically. That's what I've heard her say, or she's been quoted yeah. as saying, right? So yeah. there's that one thing on her reputation. The second thing is I saw Jason Lee, who's a blogger, kind of Instagram account. He runs an mm. Instagram account. I forgot the name of it, but it's a very popular Instagram gossip ch- channel. And he said that Lauren Hill was one of his idols. He said... I had a chance to meet her, but it was the worst celebrity experience I've ever had. He said, I got up to her and I said, oh. hi, Lauren, I'm Jay. And she cut me off, said, you will never refer to me as Lauren. You will call me Miss Hill. And I don't shake hands. Okay. And she walked off. So Fair enough. at what point do we say that somebody, we have to let go of, of like an idealization of a person when we see who they kind of really are? Because the education, the miseducation of Lauren Hill is such a beloved album that a lot of people are just mm. like, oh, Lauren Hill's great. But she's telling us kind of like that she probably isn't that great of a person. Like what, what's your thoughts on Lauren Hill? You know, it's so interesting because that story, and I feel like everyone always has this like random celebrity story, like never meet your heroes. I met this person and they were like really rude to me. It's like, there's literally zero context beyond his like version of that story. Like maybe she was like on mm. her way to the bathroom. Like maybe she was like interrupted by him whilst having like an important conversation. Like, I don't know, like, I don't like when I get these, like, don't meet your hero stories, because I don't know, I just kind of feel that, like, who knows the context in which he arrived in front of her, and then was, like, trying to assume that she would make space for a conversation with him, and be like, oh, Lauren, blah, blah, blah. Also, like, it is a bit too familiar, like, I don't know, like, there are a lot of ways to start a conversation like that, like, oh, excuse me, I I don't know, I'm a big fan, I don't know, it's weird. I find it weird, like, I, I... I'm not gonna validate that story. And also, like, I'm I'm not touching a stranger's hand either. No way. Like I, yeah. I was hanging out um, at the Grace Hopper conference last year with like our good friend and mentor, Arlen Hamilton of Backstage Capital and Higher Runner and all these amazing things, um, your first million podcast, etc. And she was like, I don't shake people's hands at conferences. I fist bump because if you shake every person's hand at a conference, you are going to get sick. And um, I'd rather not do that. So I'm kind of like on Lauren's side with that. But I think it's really interesting because we have two sides of a story, right? So on the one hand, we have Lauren's take, which is you know, I have been subjected to inaccurate headlines and, and you know, clickbait that has vilified me in a way that is unjustified and unfair. And, you know, there are some grounds to that. Like this media loves misogynoir um, and she is an unprecedented talent. And fine, she has been late to shows. I myself have waited over an hour to see her perform. It was worth oh, it. Oh, no, you're, I a, vi- did you're wait. a victim. <laughs> <laughs> I did wait. Um <laughs> But I think I think there's probably like more to this. Like, you know, it has been a while since they've released new music. Yes, nostalgia's big, but you know, they've sort of been like touring on and off, or she has anyway, for the last what, 20, 30 years without actually releasing yeah. a ton of new stuff. So that you know, it's probably also, you know, it's a bit of that kind of like diminishing returns. It's like all the people that want to see you have seen you, and there's nothing mm-hmm. necessarily new to see. I mean, I'll try and see them. Because Love Me, Some Fugees. Also, hello, Why Clef Jean, Conchal November, one of the best tracks ever. <laughs> um, I, but yeah, I don't know. What do you think? I think uh, on the Jason Lee interaction, you're right. They, if that's a one-off, that could be uh, explained by what you said. On the terms of the ticket sales and, and, and whatnot, I think one thing that is one of my pet peeves are people who do not necessarily come across as grateful for what has been given to them in the sense that like, okay, you're talented. Yes, you you are one of the greatest musicians. You've had one of the greatest albums of all time. Nobody can yeah. ever take that away from you. But when it comes to a situation where you almost feel like entitled to people coming to see you and also like you don't necessarily acknowledge that it's disrespectful to, to disrespect people's time, that to me is a yeah. pet peeve because it, for some it's become a meme almost basically, which is her lateness. Mm. It's based on yeah. consistent people's experiences and like Nobody stays hot forever. Nobody stays, you know, mm. a star forever, right? And you've just got to show love to people and appreciate them while you can. If someone's come to give you money, yeah, like, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not talking about some Tom Duke Harry who wants an autograph. I'm talking about I've come to give yeah. you money. And I'm feeling like, mm. yo, you don't necessarily respect that, you know? I, I, yeah. I don't know. That to me, 
puts me off and I wouldn't go see a show just based on that, basically. So, but listen, I'm a nobody compared to a lot, uh, Miss Hill, sorry. And she's, a, you know, yeah. going to go down into the, you know, the echelons forever yeah. with what she's produced for music. So shout out to her. But yeah, to me, I'm just and like, yo, like, show respect to the fans. But like so many things start late. Nigerian weddings, Nigerian parties. <laughs> I mean, again, I, I'm half Nigerian. So a lot of my examples are Nigerian, but you know, you could also just not show up on time to her gig. And then you're not sad that you had to wait. Like, I don't get it. Like, it's not that big a deal. If the worst thing you can say about someone is that they're late, they're doing pretty well. They're a pretty good human. Yeah. By my estimation. All right, everyone, that brings us to the end of this episode of Techish. Let us know what you think. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You know, we love to see it. Um, and otherwise, leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, share it with friends. Thank you for listening. We'll see you soon.